What does culture have to do with IBM, the computer technology company? Well, it's only the origin of the most comprehensive cross-cultural research studies. If you are studying intercultural communication, you'll likely be learning about the cultural taxonomies developed from this research by Dutch social psychologist Gert Hofsted. It started with a survey of 117,000 IBM employees who were working across 40 of the world's largest countries. Later, the research was expanded to include an additional 10 countries. That's a lot of research. While the research is old, it was conducted in the late 1960s and early 70s, and we can question the generalizability of it. Just think about who was working for IBM at that time. Hofstede's research is still considered to be one of the most comprehensive of cross-cultural research. As I said earlier, even more research was conducted in the 1990s and 2000s that not only confirmed the study results, but added some additional dimensions. This video will describe what a taxonomy is before briefly discussing the four original taxonomies of individualism and collectivism, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, and masculinity versus femininity. Then we'll discuss the two additional ones of long-term versus short-term orientation and indulgence versus restraint. What, however, is a taxonomy? Simply put, it is a classification of something, naming, describing, and organizing things into groups based on similarities. In the case of Hofstede's taxonomies, the classification is based on a scale. For example, you could describe a photograph using different criteria. Consider a black and white photograph focusing on color. Within the color category, and again we're only talking about black and white, white could be on one end of the scale with black on the other. And of course there are various shades of gray. The darker the gray, the closer it is to the black side of the scale. The lighter, well you get the picture. Color then would be the taxonomy or dimension often called an index where the scores range from low to high. And of course you can continue the categorization process in other areas looking at size, shape, type of subject, etc. Before we discuss these taxonomies, consider a few caveats. Just because someone identifies with a particular culture doesn't mean they absolutely fall into a particular category. You'll notice that I use the term tends to these are likelihoods, not absolutes. Secondly, Hofstede really focused on culture as a national culture. Hopefully by now you've figured out that culture is more than that. And if you pay attention, you may notice that some of these taxonomies could be applied to other cultures as well. Also realize that culture is dynamic. It's constantly changing. When I identify where various cultures are on these dimensions, they may not be the same as what they were in the past or where they may be in the future. Full disclosure, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm from the United States, so you may hear some of my biases in our discussion. With that in mind, we'll focus on Hofstede's four original taxonomies, starting with the one you are likely most familiar with, individualism versus collectivism, abbreviated as IDV. Collectivism would be on one side of the scale, with individualism on the other. Think of it as the I versus we or us mentality. Which is more important, the individual or the group? The higher the number, the higher the culture loads on the individualism side. In the United States, Australia, and the UK, individual needs tend to be valued over the group needs. While in many Asian cultures like China, Korea, and Japan, the needs of the group are more important than the needs of the individual. In the United States, you'll hear cliches like looking out for number one or dare to be different. While in Japan, a cliche is the nail that sticks out gets pounded down as a reminder to not stand out. In individualistic cultures, the name of the game is competition. While in collectivist cultures, the focus is on being helpful, dependable, and focused on the needs of others. A second dimension is power distance, abbreviated PDI. The I stands for index. While power between people and cultures can never be 100% equally distributed, some cultures have more of a centralized or concentrated distribution of power, while others have a decentralized, more spread out power distribution. In this case, think of power as the power others have over you. 
If someone tells you to do something, how likely are you to do it? It often depends on who that someone is, what position they hold, and who you are. For cultures with high power distances, a decentralized distribution of power, inequality is accepted as normal, and the positions people occupy come with varying degrees of power. Authority is highly respected. If an elder tells you to do something, you do it. Why? You recognize that you have less power than your elders, or your teacher, or the government, so you have to do what they say and be polite. Think about the caste system in India, where it's almost inconceivable to marry above your station. And in Mexico, where the Spanish language inherently communicates respect with two different words for you, one formal and the other informal. Malaysia, Guatemala, Panama, and the Philippines are examples of cultures with higher power distances. On the other end of the scale, where power is more centralized, equality is more, shall we say, equalized, you'll find cultures like Austria, Israel, and Denmark, and yes, the U.S. and the U.K. In these cultures, members are less likely to do something simply because they are told to. In fact, it's common to see U.S. cars with question authority bumper stickers. I can tell you that, as a professor, there is a cultural difference between students who challenge my authority and those who just accept it as appropriate. A third taxonomy is uncertainty avoidance, abbreviated UAI. This deals with your tolerance for ambiguity or uncertainty, your comfort level in unstructured situations. Are you willing to hold back and see what happens, avoiding judgment? Or do you need to have everything figured out? Are deviations from what you know intriguing or scary? In societies that tend to accept or embrace the unknown, meaning they score lower on this scale, there are fewer regulations and less discomfort with uncertainty, such as Singapore, Jamaica, Denmark, and Sweden. In contrast, countries like Greece, Portugal, Guatemala, and Uruguay are on the higher end of the scale, preferring to avoid what they do not know, with rigid codes or laws to reduce uncertainty, often believing that there is one truth and one way of doing something. The last of Hofstede's original taxonomies is the masculinity versus femininity dimension, abbreviated as MAS. This doesn't refer to biological sex, but the characteristics usually ascribed to a sex. Traditionally, males value achievement, assertiveness, heroism, and materialism. Females, on the other hand, value nurturing, cooperation, participation, modesty, and quality of life. Further, masculine societies tend to draw a line between what men do, take out the trash, and women do, take care of the children, cook, etc. Men's work is men's work, and women's work is women's work. In comparison, feminine societies have greater overlap, where men do women's chores and vice versa. Countries scoring high on this scale are considered masculine, such as Japan, Hungary, and Austria. Those landing more on the feminine side of the scale are Sweden, Norway, and the Netherlands. Those are the original four taxonomies, or dimensions. Before we go on, notice that there is an ethnocentric bias in the naming of these dimensions. Hofstede was Dutch and worked for IBM, so it's not surprising that he viewed the research results through an individualistic and masculine lens. You'll notice the names of the dimensions lean towards his cultural values. It is the individualism dimension, not the collectivism dimension. And even when softening the label to individualism versus collectivism, as I've done here, individualism comes first. And it is the masculinity dimension, not the femininity dimension, or even the more neutral gender index. Which brings us to Michael Bond and the research he did with Hofstede in the late 1980s. Bond was doing research in Hong Kong on Asian values. Together, they proposed a fifth cultural dimension, originally called the Confucianism dynamism, the name a far cry from the biases of the first four dimensions. Later, the dimension was renamed Long-Term Orientation, or LTO, sometimes referred to as the Time Dimension. You can think of this as the difference between living in the moment and planning for the future. On the Long-Term Orientation side, the focus is on, well, the long term. You should persevere, pay attention to your most important relationships, be thrifty and save for the future, 
and have a sense of shame. The flip side then would be short-term orientation, focusing on the present and the past. Personal steadiness and stability, respect for tradition, there's the past focus, saving face, and reciprocating greetings, favors, and gifts. Do it now, because you don't know what the future will bring. With its roots in Asian values, influenced by the teachings of Confucius, it's not surprising that the countries scoring the highest, having a long-term orientation, are Asian countries, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. On the other side, embracing more of a short-term orientation are Pakistan, Nigeria, and the Philippines. And yes, the U.S. and the U.K. are somewhere close to the short-term orientation side. Kind of related is the indulgence versus restraint dimension, or IVR, proposed by Michael Milnov, a Bulgarian sociologist. Hofstede added this sixth dimension in 2010, which has to do with the subjective levels people feel in terms of happiness and life control. A low rating on this scale is indulgence, where people enjoy life. They have an optimistic, positive attitude, focusing on individual happiness and well-being. Having fun and fulfilling your desires is natural. Smiling is normal, and freedom of speech is important. Brazil and the U.S. are examples of indulgent societies. On the other side of the scale is restraint. In a restrained society, people feel less happy and less in control of their lives. Smiling is viewed with suspicion. Friends and leisure aren't as important. Egypt, Russia, and China fall on the restraint side of the scale. So now you not only know what IBM has to do with culture, but you should have a better understanding of Hofstede's cultural taxonomies, both the original four and the two later editions. Of course, Hofstede's taxonomies are not the only way to look at culture. Now you can understand some of the newer taxonomies you may come across.